He was the guy who was the epitome of evil. He was the one you didn't get into the car with. Someone as sadistic as John Wayne Gacy, how do you represent someone like that? When you represent a John Wayne Gacy, you're not just representing him, you're representing all of the people on death row. He had this book in front of him, a big, thick kind of notebook, and I asked him what it was, and he was very possessive of it, and I pulled it out of his hands, and I said, what is this? It said body book, and it was a color-coded, tabbed catalog of all of the young men and boys that Gacy killed. Jeez, yeah, it's, it's, I need to take my sweatshirt off. It's some wild Did he show any remorse? No. For anyone listening, and I'm gonna have my intro kind of explain some of it, we're gonna be talking about your, your, I guess, legal and perhaps personal relationship with John Wayne Gacy. And for those that don't know who he is, you know, I'm not the most seasoned vet of his entire biography, but to me, obviously a man like John Wayne Gacy, who is the epitome of, evil in many senses of what the crimes he committed, the murder he's committed and, and many more atrocities that I can't even fathom. And for everyone listening, can you explain in a brief or however you want to explain it, your, your relationship or experience with John Wayne Gacy? So in the 1970s, John Gacy, who was an owner of a construction company in the Chicago suburbs, was doing his job, going to church, married with children, but at night he was going out and he was abducting young men and boys, bringing them to his house, torturing them, sodomizing them, killing them, and then burying most of them in his crawl space under his home. Um, at that time, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school when he was arrested for the crimes. And it was a really horrific situation in the Chicago area because he was the boogeyman when we were growing up. He was the guy who was the epitome of evil. He was the one you didn't get into the car with. So now you flash ahead 14 years and now I've gone to college, I've gone to law school and I'm pretty much a rookie lawyer when I get the call to represent John Wayne Gacy, the person in my in my uh, nightmares when I was a child. So it was a very interesting call to get. I was curious, I wanted to look evil in the eye. I had read about him for years and I really just was curious and wanted to meet him. Got it, and I understand from the eyes of the law, everyone's entitled for a representation in any matter, what shape or form, of course. But wh wh why would you, what was your reasoning? I know you just said you're interested in looking evil in its eye for how you just said it, but how do you represent someone like that? And again, I understand the eyes of the law and this or that, but I, I, and everyone deserves some sort of defense in many ways. But for someone in the case of a serial killer and someone as sadistic as John Wayne Gacy, how do you represent someone like that? Well, I've always been against the death penalty, even when I was a child. And I talk about this in my book, how my parents were both in favor of the death penalty. And I used to argue with them when I was eight years old. So I've always been against the death penalty. Why? I have no idea. And when you represent someone like Gacy, you're really, you're representing him. And, and listen, I was never doing it to get him out of prison. That was never the goal. It was never going to happen. And frankly, Gacy didn't even want to get out of prison. He told me that. What we were trying to do is to stop the execution or stay it. And when you represent a John Wayne Gacy, you're not just representing him, you're representing all of the people on death row who may have actual innocent defenses. They may have had incompetent counsel. They may have other arguments that are good arguments. So what we were doing is, you know, representing Gacy, trying to save his life, knowing that that was probably going to be a futile uh, goal. But we were also trying to move the needle, uh, pardon the pun, uh, to maybe make it harder for other death row inmates to be executed and maybe leave some room open for them to make arguments to show that they were actually innocent. I understand the angle from, you know, hopefully opening more doors for people that may potentially be innocent, if I heard you correctly. But how does that work with, like, how would John Wayne Gacy be, uh, you know, a, a, the representation of that mission when clearly he was who he was and clearly he was guilty for everything he did? So how, how would someone like him be a representation as opposed to someone who's uh, you might see as potentially innocent? Yes, well, I mean, I didn't have a choice. I wasn't called upon by any of the other death row inmates. So Gacy was the one who called me. So you take on his representation, you have to advocate zealously. And listen, when someone is going to be executed, that's really when you need a lawyer, probably more than at any point in time in your life. So Gacy got a very good representation, not only by me and the other lawyers who represented him on death row, but throughout his entire uh, travesty up and down the, the, you know, the, the courts. So, um, 
Yeah, it, this is what we do. I represent bad people. I represent people who beat their wives. I represented companies who manufacture asbestos. I represent people who embezzle from their churches. I represent people who do bad things. And I put the prosecution to the test. I file the appeals I was supposed to. And I do. if I do my job, the prosecution does his job, the lawyers and, and the judges and the jurors do their job, then justice usually gets done. And I would imagine that many people out there and your listeners are going to say, Gacy got his justice. And you said, John, you said Gacy did not want to be removed from death row or he did not want to get he out of prison? Not. He, he didn't. He didn't want to. He didn't want to get out of prison. I, I I said something to him one day and he said, no, I'd never want to walk free. I said, why wouldn't you? And he said, well, I'm safer in here. Uh, I didn't believe that Gacy was a notorious liar and a manipulator. But I really believe that Gacy, at the very end of his uh, killing career, was ramping up and he needed more and more of the evil acts to satisfy his urges. And I believe not that he was contrite, not that he was he felt guilty or remorse, because I don't think he felt any of that. I think that it was too much for him. He It was too much pressure to do what he did. And I think there was some satisfaction when he was finally caught and that he wouldn't be able to act on those urges again. So just to clarify, you said he didn't want to get it released from prison, but he didn't want to go to death row? Correct. He didn't want to be executed. He wanted and, to live. And and how many hours did you spend with him? How much time did you actually get face to face with John? Probably over 50 hours. And so obviously, you know, a, a guy like that is clearly a monster from everything that he's done. And I think it, it's presumed going into before you meet him. But was there any specific moment that you saw who he really was when you had these conversations? Like, what did you see meeting John Wayne Gacy? Well, just because someone is evil in the way that Gacy is, doesn't mean that he acts in an evil fashion. In fact, Gacy was not the least likable client I've ever had. Gacy was charming, he was engaging, he was glib, he was intelligent, he was very funny. Uh, he was warm with me, he was nice to me for the most part. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't see that side, of course. I didn't see that, but that is normal for a serial killer like Gacy whose life was compartmentalized. You know, he, like I said, he went to church. He worked very hard. He was a good father. He was a good husband in many ways. And then he did this thing that it was just evil beyond belief. So, you know, it was hard to reconcile that evil that I know he was capable of with the man that I was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. So what is that reconciling? Like, how, like do you, do you have, do you feel compassion for someone like this? It's hard to feel compassion for John Gacy. It, it was hard. When you're a sociopath, when you're a person who really lacks a conscience, um, it's very hard to be empathetic to somebody like that. But I will tell you, I didn't want him to be executed. And when you deal with someone on a human level, I don't even care what they did or who they are, there is a sense of humanity that you just don't want it ex extinguished. I mean, it's easy to say, I'll kill him. Just put the needle in his arm. I do it. I shoot his head off easy to say that until you know somebody. And I have a lot of instances of that, um, you know, with Gacy, I, my office, my office staff hated the fact that we were representing him, thought it was disgusting, didn't want to talk to him on the phone. And by the end of the representation, they too were crying that he was going to be executed, not because they were in love with him or they liked him. They just had a connection with him on a human level. And it's hard to know that somebody is going to be executed on a day certain and a time certain when you've had dealings with that person. For exclusive access to bonus content, new episodes, and more, check out our Patreon account for only five bucks a month. Link is in the description. Yeah, it's so wild. You know, obviously I can't, I haven't experienced this, so I, I can't relate. And obviously on the surface level, when you're dealing with a serial killer, it's like you, it's easy to be like, oh, what, what the fuck, excuse me, what the, what the heck is wrong with you as a representation to even have some subconscious idea of, compassion for such a disturbed individual. Well, was there anything that stood out to you through these conversations and through meeting John Gacy that were profound in a way that would oppose that initial perspective, like, you know, against the idea, oh, this is a serial killer. Like, was there specific words or anything that you learned from John Wayne Gacy that was positive, if that's even possible? Well, I, I learned a lot of things uh, from him. He was very intelligent and he was very funny and he had a way about him that could get you to like him. 
And that was how he got away with it, of course. He was very manipulative. Everybody is a pawn when you're a sociopath. And this, this goes for people who are not violent and don't kill people. This goes for people who are politicians and lawyers and doctors out there who are sociopaths or narcissists. And so he was very manipulative and he could get information from you and try to use it to, to further his own interests. I did have one experience with him that I found chilling. And that was a time where he had this book in front of him, a big, thick kind of notebook. And I asked him what it was and he was very possessive of it. And I pulled it out of his hands and I said, what is this? It said body book. And it was a color coded tabbed catalog of all of the young men and boys that Gacy killed. And he had their names, he had their pictures from their yearbook, he had pictures of their home, maybe their school pet, a newspaper article about their Little League game, and then the article when they went missing. And I said, what is this? He said, well, I paid some private investigator to put this together to figure out who these young men were buried under my house, because I can't figure it out, which was, of course, bullshit. Um, and... What he was really telling me was this was his souvenir. This was souvenirs of all the crimes he committed. So I said to him, John, what this is this body book? These are victims. These are men and boys and husbands and sons. And he said, well, what were they doing out late at night anyway? So you see that that just slipped out of his mouth and that showed how he dehumanized all of those kids that he killed. That was chilling. Jeez, yeah, it's, I need to take my sweatshirt off. It's some wild shit. I mean, so I'm a, I don't want to assume, but did he show any remorse? No. Nothing. No, no, not, nothing at all. And, and that's not surprising because this is what they do. I mean, you, you and I couldn't do what he did. You and I couldn't even watch it, let alone do it. But Gacy, you know, he, he was damaged. Whatever happened to him, a combination of nature and nurture, that turned him into that monster. Um, he not only wasn't remorseful, I think he thought of himself as a victim of this whole thing, as strange as that sounds. But that's a typical attitude for a, an antisocial personality. Oh, man. And so I want to, I want this is maybe too much of a hard transition, but he, what, what was his family situation? Because I have a question that I want to lead from that. Did he have, he had uh, living family members that attended his, because I'm sorry for not even knowing that stuff top of my head. Again, I go into some of these interviews just wanting to hear it straight from you before doing heavy research, which is against the grain. But he eventually was put to death on death row, correct? That's correct. And so he had living family members that were there that day? I wasn't able to be present at the execution, nor was his family. Even the victims' families were not. There was a strange lottery that people drew tickets. And if you were lucky enough to get the ticket, you could sit and watch him be executed. So many of the media personalities were there that day, but not really many of the family members or his family members. Um, I got to know his sister, who just died a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, and she was a lovely person. She was a person who was, who was a nice, moral, Christian woman. Uh, she was traumatized by knowing that Gacy did these things. She was shocked. She was probably more shocked than anybody, anybody because she really thought he was a generous, nice, kind person. He was a good brother. He was a good father. And he, she just couldn't come to grips with the idea that he did these crimes. And she felt horribly guilty about all the victims' families because she thought, what could I have done to see this and stop it? And then when he was executed, that was her brother. Her only brother was killed. And so she wasn't even able to be uh, righteously grieving as the victim's families were. So it was a whole other layer of tragedy for her. Yeah. And that, and that's, that's my inquiry. Like, how do you grieve being a, being related to a serial killer like John Wayne Gacy? What is that grief process? What did you notice from the family? And it's the same certain... thing. It's the exact same thing. Uh, you know, I, I mean, you talked about the, the BTK killer's uh, daughter wrote a book and she talked about how normal her relationship was with her dad. She loved her dad. She had no clue that he was capable of these things. So these people in the family are more shocked than anybody about the nature of what these people are doing. And so they're grieving too. They're grieving in a way that's different probably, how would I know? But uh, grief, definitely, definitely grief. I mean, can you imagine, you know, having to change your name, moving away, not even having a, a headstone on your grave because you don't want someone to 
to face it just because of the name. I mean, this is this changes your life in a way that's just tragic. Yeah, it kind of it relates to obviously not in the same way, but the dynamic of you going in, it's almost like flipped in some sense, because you go you went into meeting John Wayne Gacy, knowing the truth about him, and then kind of seeing the humanized side of him, which is contradictory, but then being a family member or the sister of John Wayne Gacy, you went into it, she went into it as just a brother, not knowing these things, and then finding out. So I feel like it's such a contradictory. Uh, I don't know, logical brain slash, you know, just the emotional aspect of grieving someone who was so evil, but in your eyes through most of your life, that was her brother. Yeah. And, 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 you know, and I suppose Shit. too, you have to question yourself. I mean, if I'm, you know, genetically uh, similar to, to this guy, my brother, who's killing people and torturing people, you know, who am I? And, and, and where did, where did that come from? And is part of me, uh, that person, or will my children be part of that? You know, so there's all kinds of layers of complicated feelings, and that I am not even qualified to to talk about, probably. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to go to the psychological realm, but in the eyes of your opinion, if if they're se- if they're separated by such a small degree biologically, what? How does someone like John go down that path when his sister seemed to turn out okay, based on your description? Well, you know, I can speculate like anybody else. And I've read the literally eight inches of psychiatric reports. You know, I think John Casey was born uh, probably fairly normal. I think he was named John Wayne after the macho cowboy. He turned out not to be macho. He didn't like sports. He wasn't athletic. He didn't like hunting and fishing like his dad wanted him to be. He liked cooking and gardening with his mother, and he probably knew that he had homosexual leanings. His father was relentless in berating him for that. His father beat him. His father was an alcoholic who used to take him in the basement and beat him and berate him. Again, that doesn't mean you're going to turn into a serial killer because many people grow up in families with that dynamic. He was also sexually abused twice when he was a kid. And he had two serious head injuries that put him in the hospital, which the, I, the, the psychiatrist will tell you can cause things in your brain to lack, uh, cause lack of empathy in some cases, and sometimes impulse control can be um, damaged. So, you know, I'm speculating, I'm saying all of these things and you put them all together with a Catholic upbringing. And, you know, I feel like what he was doing was going out, exercising dominance and control, which he didn't have when he was a kid, and he was killing himself over and over again by killing these young men and boys. And, um, you know, I, I think that at some point, all of these fantasies that that people like the Gacy's of the world have get mixed up in sexuality, which is very bizarre to the average normal person. And I think that those that the sex and the violence get get bound up into a fantasy that then they act upon. So uh, that's that's my uh that's my non-psychological, uh, educated uh, explanation of John Wayne Gacy. Yeah, it's wild when that that the sexuality and the violence, like it, it's weird that on the surface level of correlating those two, but it it does it's a very fine line. It's almost like they're you know on this two different sides of a very thin line, which yeah. I it, and that's just like a whole other conversation. But it, it's always wild to me when you see these serial killers like John Wayne Gacy or anyone else. And you always see those letters being written, written to them from like women. It seems to be most serial killers tend to be men. And you, you see those people that write letters to them and they, they this normal civilian seems to have sexual fantasies with these serial killers. Is that something you witnessed with John? Yes, actually. Uh, it was bizarre. I mean, there was this one woman and I, there was a TV show called the Bill Donahue show. You're way too young to remember it, but it was the, it was before Oprah, one of the first talk shows. And he had this woman on named Sue Terry. And she was talking about how she was in love with Gacy and she was going to marry him. So I saw this and I, I, next time I saw Gacy in the prison, I said, John, what are you switching teams? This woman says she's going to marry you. And He's like, oh, Sue Terry, she's got three children in the penitentiary. Like, I'm going to marry into a family like that. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so, so that was John's explanation. Yeah, no, he, uh, he, he had people pursue him. He had young men pursue him as well. He had young men visiting him. Um, I, I can't explain it. I've seen it a lot in my career where, where women just even very what you would consider to be normal women who have other options – uh, fall in love with inmates and there's books written about it. And it's to me inexplicable. Yeah. Yeah. What, I mean, do you get tied into that? 
do people ask you if 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 that's something obviously your reasoning for was the more of a defense for in generalization of the death row, but do people question your motives in regards to that sexual fantasy tying to being interested oh. in a case like this? Yeah, well, I wasn't Gacy's type, if you know what I mean. So so no, I don't think anyone ever uh I don't think anyone ever questioned that. I actually had a really interesting situation where I was on the uh I was on a uh it was a television show documentary about the Menendez brothers who killed their parents back 30 years ago. And I was dealing with his girlfriend who I think finally married him, but she was a lovely, pretty, successful, educated woman who married, I believe it was Lyle Menendez. And you sit there and you go, how does that work? How does that future work? You know? And, but she seemed normal. She seemed like she cared about him. I don't know. I don't get it. I, I mean, I don't. I don't get it either. I don't. I, it's. It's just. Uh, it's fascinating, and the psychological aspect is fascinating to me. Emotions and you know, morals aside, it's just. I don't know. It just doesn't make sense to me. But I mean, nothing makes sense to me this day and age, to be honest. Have you? <laughs> do you? Do you have any spiritual conversations with John? Like, obviously, he didn't show any remorse to all the people that he raped and murdered. Like, did he have any? What was his perspective on death in general? He didn't really face it. Uh, and he was a, he was a denier. He denied who he was. You know, one day I talked to him about being gay and next time, and he would say, you know, people should be able to do whatever they want sexually. Then he would deny being gay. He would, you know, he, he was a liar and he did not have a lot of self-awareness, put it that way. So I think even when the time came and I had to give him the news that he lost his last appeal, um, I asked him, are you ready for this? Do you, I, I just want to make sure that you know what's going on. Is there something you need? And that, you know, is there some last minute request that I can do to help you with your family or your affairs? And he just wouldn't listen to me. He wouldn't look at me. So I don't think if he was facing death and if he was really thinking about an afterlife or or coming to terms with with, with the end of his life, I, I, I couldn't see it. He wouldn't deal with it with me. So that denial and that that tendency to deny probably helped him at the end cope with it. So do you think John Wayne Gacy was scared of dying? He didn't appear to be at all. How could you not be? <laughs> How could you not be? I, I mean, I was, yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was sick for, for three months afterwards. I literally, I, I had a hard time eating or concentrating on anything because my client was just killed. And I, Gacy was, did not have a care in the world. He was focusing on his uh, final meal. So you're saying you felt like you had a grief process after the killing of John Wayne Gacy? Absolutely. I know that sounds strange, um, but it but it was very intense. And it, it, you know, first of all, he was my client. He died on my watch, and I took my representation seriously. So I I didn't have any illusions that I was going to save his life, but. I still felt responsible that he died on my watch. It's a pretty serious loss. And like I told you, whenever you deal with someone who's human, it's just, you, you know, you lost them. And how, how many times in your life do you know that someone's going to die on a certain day and at a certain time? You just don't because you want to, you want to like call the authorities, but they're the ones who are doing it. So it's yeah. very confusing and very complicated. And there's no question that all of the lawyers uh, felt the grief. And even the lawyer who represented him at the very beginning, 14 years prior to his execution, was also in grief and called me to talk to me about it and and was very upset. So, you know, it's it, unless you experience that, it's hard, it's hard to describe it. Yeah. And the closest thing I can relate to it for I'm sure plenty of people that are judging this conversation in a sense of uh, how could you possibly show any compassion XYZ? And I understand that those eyes, because I feel like I take that stance sometimes, but that's why I have these conversations to dive into something that I'm not aware of. And my relation is the first thing I thought of. This might be a terrible example, but like for when I watch like Sopranos, you got James Dan Gandolfini's character, Tony Soprano, who is clearly a, a sociopath and a murderous, violent guy. But when you watch a show like that or any uh, protagonist or antagonist in a movie or a show that is clearly a bad person by representation, the way the story is drawn up when you do get to know the character and you see the character arc there there i think and that is the intention of any script in some sense you do kind of feel bad for the bad person in a show or tony soprano you feel that a sense of compassion where you're almost rooting for the evil guy in a really weird way not in not in you know horror movies per se but like in certain characters like tony soprano when you 
get to see the human side of them and you see the little idiosyncrasies of someone who is just another person, despite all the evil stuff they're doing, there is kind of a contradictory emotion that I think the audience watches like, Oh, I'm like, you know, you're, you kind of feel bad for that character and extrapolate that to your experience or people's experience of seeing John Wayne Gacy as a human. It's like, I do see a correlation there. I, I think that's a really good point. And it, and it makes you feel kind of bad that you're rooting for the, you know, this dude who's, uh, you know, murders people and has a ham sandwich over his, you know, still warm body, as I say, as a sociopath, but listen, you know, you and I are normal. We're not antisocial personalities. We have compassion. We have empathy. Thank God. I mean, that's a normal human emotion. That's normal. So the fact that I can feel compassion or empathy for Gacy means that I'm human. And, you know, he's not. So, so you know, I think it's only normal that we treat every person as a person. And that's what makes us who we are. Yeah, I think it is important to treat everyone as a person and also, yeah, you know, with with that idea of understanding what he did and kind of balancing those two, if you could even balance those two, because it's so unfathomable of that someone could even do that. And it goes back to him thinking he's a victim and it makes sense. Like it's an unpopular opinion, but yeah, the people like it's not most people I don't think are that do these things often more than not, they're not born as a sadistic serial killer there's there's that nature versus nurture as you said and so he is a victim in many sense it doesn't justify what he did but it just seems like Correct. it is a cause it's a clear cause as to why people do these things it's the, the nurture aspect of it and for sure people are just born certain certain ways that cause certain things what whatever however you want to define it i'm not an expert in this opinion but people that do these things are a victim and there is a sense of feeling bad and it's not, uh, and that, and that's where like the the thought, like I'm like, am I a bad person for thinking that? But I'm looking at it from an objective standpoint that the, most of these people, like John, he was a victim. Yeah, I, I truly believe that. And again, it doesn't justify all the sick shit that he did. Like it's, and it's like if someone like that gets killed, I don't really feel bad as messed up as that sense. But then when you look at it from the relationship that you had, I could see the, the the tug and pull of that. Uh, of that kind of relationship. Uh, are, there, are, there, are there any other stories with John that stood out to you through those conversations that you've had? We, we talked, you know, he, he, he didn't, by the time I represented him, he was denying that he killed any of the young men and boys. So, so there was never a conversation that he was, uh, that he had with me that had any meaning when it came to that. There was one time we were talking where I just kind of got, I lost my, you know, what with him. And I said, what were those kids doing under your, your basement? You know, you, you, you walk in your house, you don't know that you've got like 29 kids under your basement and four in the river next door. I mean, come on, John, that just defies logic. If you can tell me something, maybe I can save your life. Maybe we, if you tell me where more victims are or something, I might have some leverage with the prosecution. I didn't really believe that, but I was trying. And I, he said, you know, well, he just blurted out snuff film operation. And I said, what are you talking about? Snuff film operation. And for your listeners, snuff films is, you know, where you take videos of someone killing somebody. Um, and there is a market for that. Apparently, I, I don't know. I don't. I, that's all I know about snuff films. But I, the more I thought about it, the more I thought that it's possible that there was something like that going on at that house. And here's why. Uh, there were uh, there were two victims who escaped who both said that more than one person was perpetrating sex acts on them. Gacy had two young men living with him at the time who testified that they dug the trenches. So I believe they knew what was going on and helped Gacy. The victims also said there were lights going on and off, flashing as if it were a camera or some sort of video. And when Gacy was arrested, they took out of his basement, uh, very sophisticated for the time, video cameras uh, that were never recovered. Again, I don't know why. Um, so if you put all that together and the fact that Gacy was very much an eager uh, earner of money, he, he liked money, he liked to earn money, he judged himself by how much money he made, you know, it's very possible that that was part of what he was doing. So I'm sure he enjoyed it, but I also wonder if he made money on it. Oh, man. So is, is that what you consider that a conspiracy theory? Or is that something that hasn't been pursued? It's a conspiracy theory, but I'm not the only person who came to some of those conclusions. And the fact that Gacy used those words with me, and sometimes he would blurt things out that were kind of non-responsive. And I really paid attention because when he did that, you knew you were getting a kernel of truth somewhere. 
And uh, again, I don't know that we will ever know the full extent of all of the crimes he committed, whether these other two young men were complicit. Um, but you know, unless there's a document and a diary and a film somewhere, uh, we we probably won't know the absolute truth. Damn. Oh my god. I mean, I, I feel like I could talk to you for hours. So I'm I'm so curious about uh just more stories with John Wayne and who and John Wayne. It's so weird to say John Wayne when you correlate the two. I feel like I wonder if that name just completely distorted the real John Wayne. That's like so messed up if I think about it. So so what what is so what does this all mean to you? Like what is what is this? How is this experience of you know, has spending time with John Wayne Gacy shaped your life for better or for worse? Well, when I was going through it, it was horrible because, uh, I mean, there was shunning going on. Even the legal community and the judges were saying horrible things. Let him die. You're, you know, you're not representing our, our bar very well. I got kicked out of restaurants. There was a bomb threat. I still get death threats to this day. For 30 years, I get death threats. Now with emails and text, and it's uh, it's really, really pleasant to, to wake up in the morning and uh, find people threatening your life. Um, so it was it was bad, but I will tell you this, because I did something that I thought was important, stand up against the death penalty, because I learned to speak in front of a camera, because I talked to the press, because I think I handled myself with dignity, it made me more resilient, it made me more confident, and bizarrely, 30 days after Gacy was executed, a former football player named O.J. Simpson took a drive in a Bronco down a highway or freeway in California, and guess who became the, a spokesperson for the O.J. Simpson criminal uh, prosecution? Me. You know, I was on CNN and MSNBC and Fox News, and I got a radio show as a result of that. You know, as a result of DC, my dean of my law school gave me a professorship to teach the death penalty of all things. So all of these good things happened to my career because I represent a Gacy, which makes no sense. And even now, people say, wow, you must be a good lawyer. Gacy hired you. Well, you know, I got him executed. So how good was I? But still, when you're associated with a bad person, people think you're a better lawyer. Go figure that one out. Yeah, I so mean, it's, he, it's been good. All, yeah. all in, it's been good. 30 years yeah. later, I can look back and say that. Well, that, that's my question. You, I, I know you're stand, it's, the leg there is, you know, defending the death penalty, which I understand. And you're saying it doesn't make sense why it would teeter to all these other things. But to me, it does make sense if you, because if everyone good or bad by the eyes of the law deserves representation, there's going to be plenty of more bad people out there that need representation. And you're, as you said, for your own words, you represent bad people. But what does that say about your own morality in regards to, I understand you can stand on the leg of doing it for the law, this or that, but what does that say about you in regards to that willingness to defend bad people when you know they're bad people? That's just what we do. You know, you you walk in uh, to a hospital, you're 500 pounds and you're smoking and taking drugs and you're having a heart attack. Do you think the doctor says, sir, you know, you really you really did not conduct your life in a good way. I'm, I'm not going to treat you. It's not the way it works. The doctor puts him on the table and tries to save his life. I, that's what I do. I take everybody's situation, whether they're innocent, whether they're guilty, whether there's something in between, and I try to get the best deal for them possible. That might mean plead them guilty. That might mean, you know, for people who are beating their wives, you know, I tell I tell men all the time who are beating their wives, you better stop it and you better get some anger management because you're going to kill somebody someday and you're going to be in prison forever. So I tell people the hard things they don't want to hear. I also represent victims. And I talk in my book about how I represented a family of a little girl who was sexually abused by a wealthy, politically connected neighbor who the prosecution refused to prosecute. They hired me to try to secure that prosecution, which I did, and I was happy. Mm -hmm. So I, I represent people on both sides of everything, and I do it zealously. And if I just do my job, justice usually gets done. Yeah, I, I don't agree with the example of the hospital thing, because it's just, I, I think, <laughs> comparing health and someone that did damage their own life to someone who's murdering other people, like the morality doesn't equate there for me. But in regards to shortening sentences for people that you know are bad, like I, I, that, that I'm not seeing like outside of just like money and, and I, I, don't shorten the sentence. I don't shorten the sentence. No, I know I don't you do. don't, but you're fighting for that. right? No, The judge does. But if the prosecution does a good job, which they usually do, and a defense lawyer does a good job, the judge gets to decide it. I don't make justice at all. I don't even have anything to do with it other than zealously advocate for my client. And, and listen, if I don't do that and we get the wrong person, guess what? 
that person's out walking around killing other people. Like in this Gacy case, those two young men who were helping him kill, there's no question in my mind, they walked free. So, you know, one of them committed suicide shortly thereafter. I wonder why. But my, again, I have no legal, ex- like, I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, but some people may be walking free because, okay, so so there's a prosecutor, there's someone that's defending the good and defending the bad. And in this specific case, you're defending the bad, quote unquote. The only reason some people might be walking free is because of the defense of those bad. You know what I mean? So it's like, I understand you're doing your job, totally get that. And someone's got to do it. But it's like, if you're defending the bad, the only reason, like, and I understand that, I, you have, okay, if that person's doing their job, then justice will be served. But there's also in the eyes of the law, there's been plenty of bad people that have, you know, worked their way around the judicial system legally because of someone like you that's defending the bad. And and my guess would be more innocent people have been convicted of things they didn't do. Right. And that's but, easily, that, and that, that from like the, the morality police that, that is uh, defending those people makes sense. But like, so are you, but how does it, how does it look to you in regards to going into a case where you know that like there's, there's, Blood on the hands, you know they did it. Like I understand the aspect of defending someone on the wrong side of the road that there might be an inkling of innocence, but how does it work defending someone that you know is guilty? Like the it, same thing. It's the same exact thing. I do the same thing all the time, whether it's a divorce or embezzlement or a murder. I do the same thing. I look at the situation. I try to figure out what I should do to fight it or to plead it guilty or to do what I need to do to get the best result for my client. And I do it. And that's what I do for a living. I don't judge a case. Like, I'm not going to take your case because you morally did something wrong. I, that's just not the way we're wired. I, and if you think that that's something's wrong with that, I think you have to look at the bigger system here because I don't make the justice. It, the system is a great system we have. It's the best in the world. No question. And it only screws up when one of the pieces screw up, like there's a bad lawyer asleep and drunk on the table or a judge who's corrupt or a prosecutor who's, uh, you know, trying to put someone in jail who didn't do it and knows it. You know, all these bad characters can make make a case go awry. But listen, I represent people all the time. They go to jail. They go. To, that's what that's what they should. That's what should happen. They're guilty. So I represent them. You know, I they got they got their defense. We got the right guy. And I'm just part of the system. Yeah, I hear that. I appreciate you. Uh... This has been this has been a as dark as a conversation it's been. Again, this is all fa- this is all fascinating to me to see all sides of it. So I want to thank you for taking the time to share your story. And then uh, before we wrap it up, I have a couple more questions. I will just I, before we like hit end. I just want to we're going to properly end the episode now for those of you listening. So I want to thank uh, everyone for listening to this episode. And if there's anything you want to mention uh, to as we uh, any last words per se, feel free to kind of drop the mic on your own here. No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm glad you, uh, I, I'm fine with you asking all the tough questions. And, you know, I've had, I've answered those questions for so many years and I'm happy to do it. And, you know, I always say to people, you know, don't, don't hate me because you hate Gacy because the Gacy's of the world should be hated. You should hate evil, you should hate people that take lives. You know, that's just, it's inhumane. He was inhumane, but we are, are humane. We are people who care and we're empathetic and 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 it's good that way. So you can you can hate me if you want, but when you get in trouble or your son gets in trouble, you're gonna call someone just like me. I mean, that's a fair mic drop. All right, guys, I want to thank you for tuning in, Karen Conti. I appreciate you, and uh, I'll, I'll plug some information in the show notes as usual for anyone that wants to find you, uh, find more about information about your story and your book, of course. And uh, everyone else, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Until next time. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of Dead Talks. Please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and also the notification bell. That'll give you updates as to when we post a new video, more episodes, and more content in general. We are streaming on all the major podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, and all that. And also find us on Instagram at Dead Talks Podcast or www.deadtalks.net. Thank you so much.